for our last night together. I've enjoyed this week. It has been a privilege to be here, to be part of this family, both families, AFCO and Weimar. Now, if you were expecting a nice Friday evening homily in which you could kind of sit back and unwind, not at all. <laughs> I think you know me well enough by now. I'm going to ask you to put your thinking caps on tonight. We're going to deal with a very important subject. If we can get it going. Is it not on? Thank you very much. It would help, wouldn't it? There we are. Dale Ratzlaff, a prominent ex-Adventist minister, has written, Does the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine of the cleansing of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment distort, undermine, or contradict the one and only New Covenant Gospel of Grace? That's the question. Exactly why has there been so much opposition to the judgment beginning in 1844? Less than two years following 1980, former Adventist professor Smuts Van Royen was asked in an interview, what do you see as being wrong with the Adventist doctrine of the investigative judgment? This was his answer. Let me answer that by reading a statement from Ellen White. She wrote this in the book, The Great Controversy. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon the earth. What the investigative judgment boils down to in, is this, in practice is this. When John Doe confesses the sin of impatience, that sin is not canceled but recorded. The blood of Jesus has simply transferred the sin from John to the sanctuary. In the judgment, John must face that sin again. If by that time he has not overcome the sin, it remains against him. This then makes it imperative that John overcome every sin he has ever confessed. He must, in fact, reach perfection. Now, perfectionism is a terrible thing, and it leads to devastating insecurity in one's Christian experience. But perfectionism is an integral part of Mrs. White's investigative judgment doctrine. So, the real issue is not 1844, but righteousness by faith. Specifically, the teaching of victory over all sin before Jesus comes. Now, to make his case, he had to change victory over all sin to perfectionism, which is a human attempt to be perfect in order to be saved. In other words, a straw man to make perfection repugnant to us. Some years later, Morris Venden wrote in his book, Never Without an Intercessor, the dialogue concerning the investigative judgment and related topics within our church today seems primarily an attempt to settle on our beliefs concerning sin and righteousness and salvation. He's exactly right. That's what it's all about. It's not about 1844. In his most recent book, For the Sake of the Gospel, Desmond Ford wrote the following. I would also strongly recommend Woodrow Whitten's book, Ellen White, on salvation. That word salvation is the key. Uh, his wife, Jillian, said it this way, It was Ford's emphasis on righteousness by faith that led him to see the necessity for reinterpretation of the Seventh-day Adventist scheme of prophecy. Why did he deny 1844? Because of his emphasis on the gospel. So it's very clear that all of the discussion about the judgment and the final atonement and the most holy place is really about the gospel and the plan of salvation. That's the issue at stake. So for Desmond Ford and others, be they former, current, or non-Seventh-day Adventists who hold to this salvation theology, the following are the key points involuntary sin. Now that is the belief that all become sinners simply by being born. Then you're a sinner under condemnation. Number two, the unfallen nature of Christ. That's the belief that, G that the humanity that Christ took upon himself 
was the sinless nature of Adam as it was before the fall, or that he had a hybrid nature, partly fallen and partly unfallen. Number three. Whoop, stay where we are. Salvation by justification alone. The belief that the ground of the Christian salvation includes justifying righteousness declared only as distinct from the transforming, empowering righteousness of regeneration and sanctification, which they believe are only results of salvation. You've been saved by justification, then sanctification comes along. Number four, justification as exclusively declarative and not transformative. That's the belief that justifying righteousness only declares a person righteous as distinct from actually making him righteous. And finally, number five, the imperfectibility of Christian character, which is the belief that even through imparted divine strength, perfect obedience to the divine law remains impossible for the Christian in this life. Now there's also the question of whether the atoning ministry of Jesus Christ was finished on the cross. Now the finished work of Christ concept is not the simple truth that Jesus died for the whole world and uh, brought an end to the Old Testament system of sacrifices. It's more than that. Here are some sample statements. Jesus Christ took away your sins 2,000 years ago. God forgave us 2,000 years ago and with his death it is finished. So logically, this leads to the belief that all of our sins, past, present, and future, have already been forgiven. And that once a person accepts Christ, those sins that are forgiven are surely more than past ones. Future sins also are forgiven at that moment. Adventist advocates of this teaching have used such terms as overarching forgiveness or the umbrella of eternal grace and have at times illustrated the concept by a man with a black suit with a white umbrella overhead. One author said, who believes like Ford, salvation is based on justification alone. He declares that the righteousness God produces in us has no saving value. And again, Desmond Ford insists that the final blotting out of believers' sins takes place when one accepts Christ without any need for a future blotting out of recorded sins in a heavenly judgment. Because objectors to the sanctuary doctrine do believe that our sins have already been removed by Christ on the cross and thus need not be removed either from the heavenly sanctuary or the Christian's earthly life, Sanctification is thus reduced to an unspecified, never completed work in which, which functions only as some kind of proof that you've been justified, no more than that. The definitions we give for sin, for justification, sanctification, the basis of salvation, God's ultimate requirements for his people, exert tremendous force on our conclusions regarding such key Adventist doctrines as the sanctuary, the Sabbath, the remnant church theology, and much more. If one accepts the evangelical gospel with its justification alone salvation and belief in the imperfectibility of Christian character, the notion of a heavenly tribunal investigating the lives of our, our thoughts and our deeds of professed Christians is both needless and noxious. Salvation has been completed at the cross, they say, and all that is necessary is for the Christian to accept this completed reality. Those who are seeking to blend key features of the evangelical gospel with the classic Adventist sanctuary doctrine must of necessity compromise features of both systems in order to make that harmony. This is what has been happening over the past 20 years by some of our most respected pastors and teachers in the church in a desperate attempt to blend these two systems and make them one so that we avoid being labeled as a cult. But neither scripture, the writings of Ellen White, or simple logic allow for such harmony. The consequences, consequences of such efforts to blend together will continue to be tension, inconsistent assumptions and a precariously brokered peace and in the end what we are calling unity in diversity in actuality is disunity in disagreement with much suspicion on all sides 
and in the end, I'm afraid these efforts will fail. Let's go a little farther. Since the basis for the opposing Gospels is the meaning of sin, let's refresh our memories a bit about what is at stake here. Ellen White stated, Our only definition of sin is that given in the Word of God, it is the transgression of the law. Now, when Ellen White made that statement, was she simply making a devotional statement? Or was it a doctrinal, theological statement? The only definition of sin is the transgression of the law. When it comes to theological issues like sin and salvation, some interpreters have already decided that Ellen White was not a trained systematic theologian, so the statements in her books constitute merely a devotional description. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to save us from our sins, which means that our understanding of sin is interrelated to other issues like justification, sanctification, the high priestly ministry of Christ, and the heavenly sanctuary. The interpretation of sin touches on practical issues like the nature of temptation, the possibility of developing a perfect character in a sin-filled world. I'm going to talk for a little bit about paradigms. A paradigm is a pattern of thinking to explain observed data, usually based on unproved but reasonable assumptions. One paradigm, for instance, says the Earth is the center of the universe. Another paradigm says the Earth is on the edge of a galaxy in the universe. The Ptolemaic uh, paradigm did not just morph into the Copernican paradigm by some adjustments along the way. Rather, it was replaced by a new paradigm which was diametrically opposed to it and was incompatible with it. As a scientist, Leonard Brand, stated, putting the sun in the middle of the galaxy is one option, putting the earth in the middle is another. One can't make a compromise between them. We must choose one or the other. Now, how does all that relate to the interpretation of sin? The correct understanding of sin must be placed in the correct paradigm. If this does not take place, we will never come to a correct understanding. Um, the early church fathers, the early uh, leaders of the church were heavily dependent upon Greek philosophy for their understanding of the doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, and the doctrine of sin. Augustine, he believed that God sovereignly predestines all that happens, including both sin and evil and salvation and righteousness. It's all predestined. The magisterial reformers like Luther and Calvin also tended to accept Augustine's views on this matter. Also, some Adventists tend to base their views of justification and sanctification on the view of the reformers. So how did this uh, paradigm influence the meaning of sin? Here is from Augustine. The newborn infant, as well as the middle-aged person, is corrupt and guilty because of the connection with Adam. For instance, he stated that before the fall, uh, people could not, could, are free from sin, but after the fall, people are free to sin, but not free not to sin. Thus, sin, righteousness, salvation, and damnation are all the results of God's decision, not yours. If you cooperate with God and be saved, it's because He decided that, not you. And if you are lost, you had nothing to do with it. The doctrine of original sin has its basis in the doctrine of predestination as interpreted by Greek philosophy. Under the Greek philosophical paradigm expressed by Augustine, freedom not to sin does not exist. If that's the case, then to define sin as transgression and hold a person accountable for it makes absolutely no sense, since a person was merely carrying out the irresistible will of a sovereign God. So let's compare that with a few statements, great controversy statements. It is Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God, the nature of sin, and the real issues at stake in the great controversy. His sophistry lessens the obligation of the divine law and gives men license to sin. So why does the devil want to misrepresent the nature of sin? Because he knows that misrepresenting that doctrine will lead to a lessened obligation of God's divine law. Another statement. 
The teachings of heathen philosophers exerted an influence in the church. Many who professed conversion still clung to the tenets of their pagan philosophy. Serious errors were thus introduced into the Christian faith. Prominent among these was the belief in man's natural immortality and his consciousness in death. So on account of this body-soul dichotomy, the experience of salvation takes place in the timeless soul that has no causal connection with the body. Within the, furthermore, the body is where original sin takes place, and within this paradigm, condemnation is the res result of having sinful flesh, your body, which includes impulses and tendencies and desires, and you are condemned because of that. The immortality of the soul, as considered within the paradigm of Platonic philosophy, assumes the absolute sovereignty of God and the total depravity of man. While in this totally depraved state, man's condition is hopeless. He is born into this world already guilty and condemned for Adam's sin. The only freedom he possesses is the freedom to sin. He is incapable of even choosing not to sin. Ellen White again. To many minds, the origin of sin and the reason for its existence are a source of great perplexity. There are those who in their inquiries concerning the existence of sin endeavor to search into that which God has never revealed. So what they have said is God chooses some out of this human mass of perdition into which we are all born to receive the gift of faith by grace and leaves others to their deserved damnation. That's just the way it is. The implication is clear. Sin has nothing to do with the transgression of the law. If God has decreed you to be righteous, you cannot resist his will. The concepts of freedom and choice and sin must be interpreted within this Greek philosophical framework. And when that is done, one is either saved or lost by God's divine decrees. Sin is forever divorced from choice and character development has been fixed by God. Again, a little farther in the great controversy. Others fail of a satisfactory understanding of the great problem of evil from the fact that tradition and misinterpretation have obscured the teaching of the Bible concerning the character of God, the nature of his government, and the principles of his dealing with sin. So I think you're beginning to see that the great controversy paradigm is very different from the predestination paradigm. They are two different ways of observing what God is doing and giving an answer to what's going on. Ellen White describes predestination in these words. The salvation of heaven depends upon nothing which we can do in this life, neither upon a present change of heart, nor upon present belief, or a present profession of religion. So, the doctrines of the immortality of the soul, original sin, total depravity, lead directly to the, conclu to, to the conclusion that sin has nothing to do with choice. It just has nothing to do with it. The root cause of the notion that sin is divorced from choice lies in this whole paradigm, immortality of the soul, divine decrees, coming from the Greek philosophical paradigm, and the implications for Christology and lifestyle are enormous. The data can only be interpreted by one or the other of the two systems. Both can't be combined together. So let's look at the sanctuary great controversy paradigm. The sanctuary in heaven is the very center of God's work in behalf of men. It opens to view the plan of redemption. It is of the utmost importance that all should thoroughly investigate these subjects. So if the plan of redemption must be interpreted from within the sanctuary doctrine, then by logical consistency the doctrine of sin must also be understood from the same paradigm. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their characters must be purified from sin through the grace of God and their own diligent effort. They must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people on earth. Now this passage is in obvious opposition to what we read earlier from the other understandings of sin. In the previous paradigm, guilt and condemnation arise simply from being born with sinful flesh. 
These have been received by inheritance and are not eliminated by conversion. It's the same. But this passage reveals a very different perspective. If sin is to be put away by the grace of God and their own diligent effort, then human beings must have freedom to sin as well as to choose not to sin. This means that the biblical paradigm does not support the idea of total depravity and the bondage of the will, in which the will cannot make choices. This definition of temptation and sin can only make sense in the light of the great controversy where individuals have complete freedom of choice. The following statement has great implications for temptation and sin and victory in Christology. Now, while our great high priest is making atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. It is in this life that we are to separate sin from us. Well, doesn't this passage indicate that sin as transgression is the only definition that will work? In the following passage, Mrs. White stated that contamination and defilement come only when a person is free not to sin. Christ's victories make it possible for us to conquer. No man without his own consent can be overcome by Satan. The tempter has no power to control the will or to force the soul to sin. He cannot contaminate. Willfully violating one of God's requirements silences the witnessing voice of the Spirit and separates the soul from God. And then she says again, sin is the transgression of the law. Once the great controversy, sanctuary paradigm is discerned as the right one, then the only definition of sin that works is transgression of the law, not birth state. Putting away sin does not refer to the sinful flesh that we inherited, but to the deeds of the flesh which we practice. Inheriting a sinful nature from Adam does not contaminate our character. It's transgression that does that. Inheriting sinful flesh does not destroy a person's ability to, be choo to choose to be free from sin. Ellen White's insistence that our only definition of sin is the transgression of the law is then a theological statement, not just a devotional statement. She rejected the Greek philosophical paradigm that produced natural immortality, total depravity, and the doctrine of divine decrees, which sees sin as totally divorced from choice. When she referred to putting away sin by cooperating with the grace of God, her statements assume that human beings have genuine freedom to choose whom they will serve. It's no more possible to blend these two paradigms together than, for, than to use the earth and the sun as models for the cosmos and explaining planetary motion. Just like the correct definition of sin, one must choose in which paradigm to work. So I'm suggesting that the great controversy paradigm must be our way of understanding the plan of salvation. No other way will work if we're trying to follow the Bible. And it is very strange but true that an irreconcilable division between two vastly different and opposite claims still remains in the great controversy theme as interpreted by some Adventist teachers. We still are struggling with this issue. Now, in the great controversy paradigm, sin has fundamentally two components. Number one, the weakening effect of Adam's transgression passed down to us through the law of heredity in a fallen, sin-prone human nature of which none are guilty and condemned. We get all of that, but we're not guilty or condemned for it. Number two, our own sinful choices for which we are responsible and liable. Two effects of sin, one inheritance, no condemnation, one choice, condemnation and accountability. The only thing, the only thing we inherited from the fall of Adam spiritually and as a result of the fall is a weakened human nature 
a weakened nature. We call it the fallen sinful flesh. However, in no way do we receive guilt from or deserve any punishment for Adam's sin. To believe this would necessitate accepting Roman Catholic and Protestant teaching of the dogma of original sin. Subsequently, we would also be compelled to believe in and practice something called infant baptism. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that original sin is universal. Every child is therefore defiled at its birth with the taint of Adam's disobedience. Hence, baptism, which washes away original sin, is as essential for the infant as for the full-grown man. So there is the problem, and there is the remedy put together in one clear statement. The Augsburg Confession of Protestant Princes said, Since the fall of Adam, all men are born in sin, which places under condemnation and brings eternal death to, those, to all who are not born again by baptism, now that's infant baptism, and the Holy Ghost. So the Catholic and the Protestant definition are exactly the same on this point from the Reformers' times. Now, this teaching of original sin did stem from Greek paganism, channeled by Augustine into the Christian church, into the Roman Catholic Church, held by the majority of Protestants since the, the, the Reformation. It is the false belief in original sin that logically requires that Christ assume the nature of man before he fell to free him from the guilt of original sin so he would not be born as we are. They say, if he were born with a sinful nature, he also would need a Savior. We hear that much within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The next logical step, of course, is accepting the false belief of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, the mother of Jesus, so that Jesus could receive a sinless human nature. The Protestant version is just a little different. Not Mary, but Jesus skipped 4,000 years of heredity with some kind of immaculate conception, I guess. False belief about the nature of sin inevitably leads to false beliefs about the nature of salvation and how God saves sinners. So whatever conclusion is reached regarding the, the effect of the fall of Adam and the nature of sin transmitted in that fall will logically determine our conclusions on the human nature of Jesus Christ. Norman Gully wrote that the two conflicting understandings of the human nature of Christ spring from two different understandings of what constitutes sin. And he's absolutely right. It's not an argument about the nature of Christ. The issue is why we are sinners before God. The truth is, Christ became one of us. He took on himself at his incarnation the same weakened, fallen, human, raw material that we inherit that we have as a result of the fall. Sinless human nature before the fall couldn't even die, but sinful human flesh after the fall could die. Now at his incarnation, Jesus then took on the fallen, weakened nature of humanity, the same humanity of the men and women he came to save, which was the whole point of his becoming a human being. He came to be one of us, as we are. Jesus took on the same, quote, sinful flesh of the fallen human nature to which we are subjected, and he defeated the power of sin in that weakened nature. That's the marvel of his victory. As Jesus relied on and received strength to God, to God's strength to do all that he did, so we can, in complete surrender to Jesus Christ, experience victory and salvation from sin. The gospel takes a different turn. May be surprising to many that some of the most eminent Protestant theologians of the second half of the 20th century have openly declared that Christ's human nature was that of man after the fall. Not many Christians know that. Some of the most prominent Protestant theologians of recent times have said it was just man's nature. During the first hundred years of Adventism's existence, 1852 to 1952, Adventists taught the post-fall nature of Jesus Christ as the undisputed Adventist position. There was no argument about it. Today, a majority of Protestants and increasingly many in the Adventist church have accepted the teaching that Christ took the human nature of Adam before the fall or a hybrid nature, half-fallen, half-unfallen which is the same thing. All right, a couple more statements. 
The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. This is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. And the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. The great work of redemption could be carried out only by the Redeemer taking the place of fallen Adam. To shift the Seventh-day Adventist Church from its consistently held position from 1852 to 1952 on the fallen nature of Jesus Christ does represent a formidable task. One of the strongest and most active proponents of this new anti-Adventist interpretation proposing a pre-fall human nature of Christ was Leroy Edwin Froome back in the years 1950. When Barnhouse and Martin discussed with the questions on Doctrine Trio the problem of the incarnation, as they called it, they were assured that, quote, the majority of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination have always taught the humanity of Christ to be without sin, holy and perfect, despite the fact that certain of their authors have on occasion succeeded in getting into print opinions completely contrary and repugnant to the majority of the church, end quote. Apparently, though, all of this bending to Barnhouse's viewpoint and Martin's view viewpoint did not significantly improve his in perception of Adventists. Barnhouse is reported to have said, all I am saying is that the Adventists are Christians. I still think their doctrines are about the screwiest of any group of Christians in the world. In summary, the Bible teaches that we inherit the effect and not the guilt of Adam's fall. Adam transmitted a weakened, fallen human nature with an inclination to sin. We have fundamentally two basic theological systems on which to build. There is the Roman Catholic, Calvinistic, Evangelical grid, whose predominant claims are the Augustinian sovereignty of God, we are all born sinners, infant baptism, we will continue sinning until the Lord returns. Romans 7 describes a converted man. Jesus was born with a sinless human nature like Adam's before the fall. His human nature was not like ours. Therefore, the crucial descriptions of salvation, the new birth, being a new creation, having Christ dwell in us, are incapable of being rightly understood. Then there's the Adventist form of Arminianism, which maintains we were all born with a tendency towards sin. However, if we live completely surrendered and dependent on God as Christ was, we can experience salvation from our sins now. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Jesus is our substitute and our example of victorious living. Jesus was born with a fallen nature like Adam's after the fall. His human nature was like ours. Thus, crucial descriptions of conversion can be rightly understood. Attempting to resolve the debate over Christ's human nature cannot be done by amalgamation of the pre-fall and the post-fall interpretations. It's a question of one or the other, and we really better know which it is. Questions on Doctrine was the ultimate Trojan horse that officially opened the floodgates of Catholic and Calvinistic theology into the divinely established Seventh-day Adventist belief system. That book attempted to reverse a hundred years of Adventist teaching on the fallen nature of Jesus Christ. This part of our church history may help us under understand the internal disunity regarding Christian standards today, our remnant identity, the reasons for the delay of Christ's second coming. As uh, Zürcher pointed out in his book, Touched with Our Feelings, if we are mistaken about the human nature of Jesus, we risk being mistaken about every aspect of the plan of salvation. We may fail to understand the redemptive reality of the grace bestowed upon humans by Jesus to set humanity free from the power of sin. Ellen White said in Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 929, in our conclusions, we make many mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our Lord. When we give 
to his human nature a power that is not possible for man to have in his conflicts with Satan, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. End quote. And my friends, we simply do not have the power of Adam's unfallen nature. What a power that would be. Or even a hybrid, partly fallen, partly unfallen nature. We don't have that power either. Why then? Do some strategically placed conservative Adventists persist today in holding to the pre-fall view? I can think of three reasons. First, respect for authority. What is assumed and what is taught through the church's established channels, especially if its promoters appear gracious, deeply committed to Adventism, faithful to classic Adventist teachings, it's easy then to accept what they say on this also and just take it for granted that they know what they're talking about. Such persons often ask themselves silently, if not vocally, how can so many good, intelligent, obviously committed Seventh-day Adventist Christians be wrong? Respect for authority. Number two, a negative association with the post-fall view. Uh, the assumption has been widely promoted during recent years that belief in post-fall Christology is a trademark of critical, anti-denominational malcontents more interested in throwing rocks at the church than building it up. And you don't want to be part of that group. Number three, a pious revulsion at the thought of Jesus experiencing fallen fleshly temptations. The idea of our pure, spotless Savior having anything that could be called sinful is abhorrent to certain ones. To think of inherited desires pulsing through the nerves and senses of their unblemished Lord, even if thoroughly resisted by a sanctified will, is deeply disturbing knowing their own pension to yield to such desires and urges, they don't want the incarnate Christ anywhere near that. So Christ can't be touched with those feelings. Now, what bearing do the issues of sin and the nature of Christ have on the daily experience of salvation, justification, and sanctification? I'm going to share briefly two letters to Ministry Magazine, one from a Catholic priest and one from a Lutheran pastor. Both referred to the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification by the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church. It details a common understanding of our justification by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Our common understanding. Lutheran and Catholic. Roman Catholics and Lutherans now agree on the essence of justification by grace through faith. And a reference in this letter is made to Benedict's wonderful paper on justification which he gave last year. Could it be that false views of sin and the nature of Christ are blurring the lines between Catholicism and Protestantism? on practical issues of the gospel like justification by faith? The truth is, the Adventist gospel, that's the title of tonight's message, do we have an Adventist gospel? The Adventist gospel is not the typical Catholic nor the typical Protestant gospel, which is why it's not liked by either side. Here's an example of the unique Adventist understanding by another letter writer to Ministry Magazine. First of all, quoting Ellen White, it is by continual surrender of the will, by continual obedience that the blessing of justification is retained, end quote. This theme, the letter writer says, is repeated throughout Scripture. By the way, this places a major emphasis on sanctification if we're going to have continual obedience, continual surrender of the will. Continuing, here is where many Protestants and Catholics fail equally substituting church traditions for the standard of God's Word. Christians are fully justified from the first moment they believe on the basis of Christ's works and none of their own, yet this free gift may be lost if we fail to appropriate the other blessings that come with it, conviction of God's will and the power to carry it out. In other words, Justification without sanctification is a false gospel, is what the letter writer is trying to say. A little story. 
Johnny loved sledding. One snow white day, Johnny climbed a hill behind his house that he had never slid down before. It was steep, so he knew he'd really fly down that hill. His mom was out in the backyard and saw the sled bearing her son speeding down the hill. And then she saw a hidden, neck-high, barbed wire fence that he was speeding toward. Lie down, she screamed. Against the blinding white snow, Johnny didn't see the fence nor any reason at all to lie down. But he heard his mom's command and he did what he had always done. He obeyed. Lying back on the sled, he flashed under the barbed wire and into his mom's arms. Johnny brings us face to face with a question that every one of us has to answer. Are we to obey God even when you don't understand why? Does a trust relationship with God ask for obedience even when we don't understand God's commands? Don't know why he says it. We all have one great pressing need in common. The need to base our faithfulness to God on his, on his trustworthy promises to us because they're always right, even when we don't know why. Without understanding, being willing to act before the fact. Obedience before complete understanding because we trust God sets the Adventist gospel apart from all other versions of the gospel. Remember, righteousness is supposed to be by faith, isn't it? We trust God. And it's always connected with always unquestioning obedience. We never quibble when we hear God's call. This is why only the Adventist gospel can honestly speak of true Christian perfection. Christ's pure attitude motivated, it by, motivated absolute obedience resulting in a complete uh, relationship with, with his Father. That's true perfection. Ellen White says this sacrifice was offered for the purpose of restoring man to his original perfection, yea, more, to give him an entire transformation of character. So the imparted righteousness of Christ is the work he does in us, a oneness with him. That's what being made perfect in our sphere really means, transformed inside out. It is to be perfectly one with Him. Our attitudes are changed, motivating obedience to Him to reflect Him fully. We grab a hold of everything about Christ we can get hold of, everything which shadows His glory we want to have. By beholding, we become like Him and are changed into His glory. Scientists have recently discovered a way to make what they think is the first 100% perfectly flat and smooth surface on highly machined and polished glass. It's so flat and so smooth that when one sheet of glass is slid over the other sheet, displacing all the air, the bond between those molecules becomes so great that it is nearly impossible to separate the two sheets of glass. They are truly one. The righteousness that Christ wants to impart to us is the perfect oneness we can have through His Holy Spirit's leading. Obedience motivated by genuine love allows him daily to grind us and polish us so until we are so absolutely bonded to him that we will, it will be nearly impossible to separate us from Christ. This unique and precious Adventist understanding makes it especially difficult to hear the previous editor of the Adventist Review say, the issues frequently heard involve Christ's human nature and Christian perfection. A small but vociferous minority continue to urge the ideal of sinless perfection. They do not have the support of church leaders, however, he said. He said, if we are to speak of uniqueness concerning Adventist doctrine, then it is the configuration of doctrines rather than in individual beliefs. What did Ellen White say? There is as great difference in our faith and that of nominal professors as the heavens are higher than the earth. Raymond Cottrell, writing in the Review in 1958, said, Were Seventh-day Adventists to yield their distinctive teachings in order to win and wear the robe of theological respectability, they would doubtless be accepted by other Christian bodies, but in so doing they would be traitor to the truths that have made them a people. They would no longer be Seventh-day Adventists. 
Satan is now using every device in this sealing time to keep the minds of God's people from the present truth and to cause them to waver. I saw a covering that God was drawing over his people to protect them in the time of trouble, and every soul that was decided on the truth and was pure in heart was to be covered with the covering of the Almighty. We need to be enlightened in regard to the plan of salvation. There is not one in 100 who understands for himself the Bible truth on this subject that is so necessary to our present and eternal welfare. The promise of the most holy place is the promise of perfection of character, perfection from all sins, both known and unknown. By ignoring these two apartments and teaching only the blessing of the first apartment is in essence saying there's no difference. It is marching back to Egypt, back before 1844. It is attempting to close the open door and open the closed door. The enemies of the present truth have been trying to open the door of the holy place that Jesus has shut and to close the door of the most holy place which he opened in 1844. The only special truth that Ad of Adventists that is not taught by some other religion or denomination is the message of the final atonement, the judgment, and the cleansing of the sanctuary. And Ellen White says the minds of all who embrace this message are directed to the most holy place where Jesus stands before the ark making his final intercession. And then she says everything that is imperfect in us will have been seen and put away. All envy and jealousy and evil surmising and every selfish plan will have been banished from the life. And you know that includes pride superiority, self-righteousness, those are the roots of these other sins. That's what causes us to have imperfect things in us. And these deep-seated roots are only removed by the miracle of God's grace. We can't get them out. Why should this procedure be delayed until 1844? God is seeking to prepare a people who will have unqualified conquest of evil in their lives. Why? To forever demolish the charges of Satan against the character of God. The judgment has been held off until the end of the world because only then will God have a totally perfected people. Yes, God could use a man like Martin Luther without any question whatsoever. A man who drank beer and hated Jews but he cannot accept such a performance from believers at the close of the great controversy. Time has lingered through the Inquisition and the Holocaust, through slavery and segregation, through Rwanda and Darfur, because God continues to wait for a generation whose unbroken triumph over sin will silence the last accusation of the enemy. What some have called last generation theology is therefore the logical and essential corollary of the 1844 investigative judgment doctrine. This, my friends, I believe is the Seventh-day Adventist gospel and the everlasting gospel which will go to the whole earth under the three angels flying throughout the world. Are we very clear? Do we know for sure the difference when we hear two different gospel pr gospels presented? Do we know where they came from, why it is important that we know the difference, and what will happen if we lose sight of the true gospel of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Bible? May God help us. Each one of you, as you move forward in your own study, in your own understanding of God's Word, to be discerning students of the Word, not superficial listeners, but discerning students so that when you hear error, you know why it's dangerous and you know where to go to find the truth.